Good morning, Pax Naz and Church. Thank you so much for logging on and joining us this morning. Things are a little unconventional and not how we would prefer them, but this is still a great thing, and we'd be doing this anyway. We'd love to be in the sanctuary with y'all and giving you hugs and uh, just talking about your days and your weeks. Uh, but right now, we have this so that we can stay safe. Um, but I'm so thankful, so thankful for, the, for this technology. And I pray that you guys had a really, really good Thanksgiving uh, with your immediate families and however you celebrated. Uh, I pray you stayed safe and healthy uh, and that you'll continue to do so. Um, this morning, we have um, begun the Advent season. This is our first Sunday of Advent, and we are discussing the message of hope. It's a hopeful message, but it's a message of waiting in a time of darkness and unknown. We're going to start out with uh, lighting the hope candle on the Advent wreath. And then Marlena is going to share a brief message that the Holy Spirit placed on her heart. Then we'll go into our time of worship with Matt. And then we'll go into our message and we'll talk a little bit more about hope and waiting in time of oppression. Waiting on a Savior to come. Waiting on Christmas. first Sunday of Advent, and the first candle to be lit represents hope. So what is hope? Hope is an expectant anticipation of looking forward to something. During Advent and Christmas, we look forward to celebrating the birth of our Savior, of Christ entering the world. It's like hosting a fancy dinner party for a very important special guest. You make all the preparations, you plan the menu, you buy the food, you clean your house, and then it's finally time to await the arrival of the guest of honor. This is the time we take to prepare our hearts for Jesus' arrival and the significance of the hope that his birth gives to us. One of my favorite Christmas carols is O Holy Night, and my very favorite stanza goes like this. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. When Jesus came down to earth to be born as a tiny baby in a humble stable, he came to be the hope of the world, to be the promised Messiah, to save us from our sins. Like the candle of hope, Jesus came to bring light to a darkened world and lift us up out of our sin and error. And we don't have to pine anymore because we have a thrill of hope, just like the song says, and that is cause to rejoice. Because the hope that Jesus brings and is the light of a new and glorious morning of eternity spent with him. When a candle's been lit, it can never be extinguished by the darkness, but instead it chases the dark shadows away. As we begin this Advent season, we remember that Jesus was born as the light of the world to save us from our sins. Hope is one of the most beautiful expressions of faith that believers can display, and it's something that the darkness and all the sin of this world can never take away from us. And as believers, what a thrill of hope that gives us, like the flame of a candle, filling our souls with God's love.
Good morning, everybody. We're glad you're, you're able to join with us here. Uh, we hope that you had a, a wonderful and blessed Thanksgiving weekend. And as we enter into the Christmas season and the anticipation uh, celebrating the coming of our Savior, uh, today we're going to talk about hope. Through the clothes 
Good morning again, friends, family, church. Happy to have you join us again this morning online for church. Thank you to Matt for that time of worship. Thank you to Marlena for her message about hope. I know things are a little bit unconventional right now, and they look a little bit different. But I want us to really take a good look at Advent this year. This morning we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a time of waiting. It's the few weeks that lead up to Christmas, which is, of course, where we celebrate the birth of Jesus. But Advent, particularly this morning, this first Sunday, It's a time of hope, but it's also a time of waiting, waiting for the oppression to end, waiting for the darkness to turn to light, waiting for a savior. Have you ever been in a scary or dark situation that made you wait? It was scary because of what you were going through, but it was made even scarier because you were uncertain of the future, what the outcome would be. When Luke tells of the story of Jesus' birth, he says, when Joseph and Mary came to Bethlehem, it came to pass. While they were there, the days were fulfilled. And she brought forth her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The days were fulfilled, Luke says. I suppose this means that after nine months of waiting, the time was right. It was right for Mary, but I wonder if it was right for the rest of the world. Years later, Paul wrote in a letter to the Galatians. 
He spoke of a, a whole world that had been waiting. He said, when the, full, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son. If you look for a few moments beyond the story of the manger, the story that we celebrate most of the time at Christmas, and if you look at the bigger story of what God was doing in the world as a whole, you'll see the time of waiting for Jesus' birth was much longer than nine months. It was several thousand years of often scary and dark waiting. Our reading this morning is going to be Galatians 4. It's a little bit longer than normal. So I'm going to read through it. I'm using the NIV version this morning. It'll be Galatians chapter 4. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Tell me, who, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. 
The woman represents two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerus Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. In that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. It all started about 4,000 years ago when God appeared to a Middle Eastern nomad named Abraham. God told Abraham to leave his country, his relatives, and everything so he could go to a land that God would show him. God promised Abraham he would make him into a great nation. And from Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That seed, of course, would be Jesus. Abraham believed and obeyed God, but he spent the rest of his life waiting for that covenant to be fulfilled. Not a lot happened over the next 600 years. Abraham had lots of descendants, but they were really not much of a blessing. After centuries of multiplying in Egypt, Abraham's descendants became a threat to Pharaoh. Pharaoh then forced the people into slavery. God raised up a man, Moses, to deliver those people from Pharaoh and lead them to the edge of the promised land. God came to Moses with a promise. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen, like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Through the years, God raised a lot of prophets after Moses, but people still waited for the special promised prophet. Once they finally arrived in the promised land, God's people waited another 400 years until God raised up a king named David. David wanted to build a house for God, but God said, nope, and he offered to build something even greater for David. God said, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Jesus would fulfill that promise. When he entered Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, the crowd shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. But David waited and never saw that covenant fulfilled. Now looking back, David's immediate descendants actually made a huge mess of things. 400 years later, the nation of Israel was split into two. They had a northern and a southern kingdom that had forsaken God and were in exile, facing possible extinction. It was then that God raised up prophets like Isaiah, who promised new life for the nation in the coming of one called Messiah, 
who would be delivered, who would deliver his people and restore them to glory. Isaiah wrote, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel for child will be born to us. A son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. It took 500 years for this prophecy to be fulfilled. A remnant of Israel had returned to the promised land, but it was not a glorious return. They were under the rule of Rome. The memory of the promises made to Abraham, Moses, David, and Isaiah were still alive and well in the hearts of many Jews, but God's people were still waiting. It was into this darkness that the Christmas event finally came. The fullness of time had been much more than a nine-month wait. God's people had known 2,000 years of anxious waiting. After all these years of waiting, God finally sent to earth the one who would bring those promises to pass. In Galatians, Paul said, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. A few verses earlier, he compared the timing of Christ's birth to the time a boy reached manhood in Jewish society. He said it's only when a young man becomes of age that he can really experience the privileges of sonship. So when Paul said that God sent his son in the fullness of time, you might say the world had come of age. But why? Why was this finally the right time for God to send his son? Historians tell us it was the right time politically. The Roman Empire was at its height. It was also the right time culturally. Greek language, excuse me, Greek language and culture brought an element of cohesion to society. More people were being educated and were able to read than ever before. When the New Testament was written, it was written in Koine Greek, a language that a majority of people understood. Again, this made it more likely for the message of Jesus to take hold. But most of all, it was the right time spiritually. The average citizen of Rome was tired of the same old religion. The mythological gods of Greece and Rome were losing their grip on folks. Even the Jews were hungry for something more. Groups like the Pharisees tried to get their countrymen back to a form of Judaism based on a strict interpretation of the Old Testament. But deep down, most people knew they couldn't live up to that. It was a time when many people longed for a relationship with God that was authentic and about more than just keeping up with his rules and regulations. But here's the strange thing. When Jesus was finished with his life and ministry, on the surface, very few things had changed. In a sense, people were still waiting. Sure, he pulled off some miracles and had a group of about 120 devoted followers 
But think of it from the perspective of the promises God made about the coming of the Messiah. God promised them a land. But when Jesus had ascended, the land was still occupied by Rome. They expected Messiah to deliver them from Rome. From Roman rule. He didn't do that. A few years later, even Jerusalem and its temple would be leveled to the ground and once again God's people scattered. When it came to the land, they were still waiting. God also told David that his throne shall be established forever. Isaiah said of the coming one, the government will rest on his shoulders. There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace. In another prophecy, Zechariah said, His dominion will be from sea to sea, but Jesus had come and gone, and nothing seemed to change at all. What happened to the promises? What happened to the covenants made by God? Even the New Testament writers seemed to expect something more to come. Paul said, A time would come when everyone, every knee would bow. Every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord of all. What happened to that? John looked to a time when death and mourning and crying and pain would no longer be. It would matter no more. Show me a place like that today, here. Peter looked to a time when there would be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Even Jesus himself encouraged us to look for something more. There was something else. He spoke often of his kingdom, but it wasn't an earthly kingdom. He taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. He also said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's almost like the fulfillment of his kingdom and his promises come to us in two installments. What we celebrate as Christmas brought the first installment. In this first installment, God sent his only son, Jesus, our king, the one called Emmanuel, God with us. He lived a sinless life and he offered himself on the cross as payment for our sins. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Because of what he accomplished, he can offer salvation from sin and death to all who put their trust in him. This is the gift we celebrate at Christmas. But 2,000 years have passed, and we're still waiting for the second installment. It's like God gave us a down payment, but we're still waiting for payment in full. In a way, we're waiting for another Christmas, another arrival of Jesus. Just as God sent his son in the fullness of time at the first Christmas, he'll do it again the second time. So just like all the believers before us, we wait. We wait for our Savior to come again. Sometimes we wait in darkness. Sometimes we wait in sorrow. Sometimes we wait in fear. But more so now than ever before. We can wait in hope. We can wait in peace. We can wait with joy and we can wait in love. Because we have the privilege of knowing about all the previous promises that were fulfilled before. 
So as Matt sang in our time of worship, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus. But also thank you for the knowledge in your word and the reminders of the time spent waiting for that to happen. We take for granted because the world is different now. That we're just living our lives trying to fill voids and gaps with pleasures and pastimes until his second coming. But there was so much darkness and there was so much oppression that first time before Jesus came, before he was born in that manger. Lord, I'm not sure that we can even comprehend from where we sit or stand right now. But I help you, I hope and I pray that you help us have a little glimpse of that so that we can honor those, so that we can mourn with those who were in waiting for their Savior to come. Thousands of years. But still the hope of those promises maintained. That could only be done through you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will help us reflect on the hope, the hope we have in this world that Jesus died for us relieved us of our sins and drew us closer to you so that we can have that genuine relationship that is not fully dependent on the rules and the regulations of the law of the Old Testament. Those things are important, Lord. But what comes first and is most important foundationally is that relationship with you. Everything else falls into place. Thank you, Jesus, for this time with my church family. Thank you for this technology and the ability to still do what we need to do in a time where we're trying to be safe and healthy. Pray for those who have been affected this entire time, Lord, but primarily over this last few weeks. A few of us have had to quarantine. It's made things pretty difficult. But you've been with us every step of the way. And I pray you'll continue to be with us. Guide us. Protect us. Heal us. And draw us closer to the hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us this week. And we'll see you next week as we continue to talk about peace.